Okay, uh, welcome to my talk and thanks for the opportunity you give me to present some of my preliminary results of my PhD thesis. And um, I will present um, how I tackle some evolutionary questions with morphology. Um, and these uh, questions regard um, complex life cycles and adaptive decoupling. So first I would like to introduce some um, some words to use of uh, what exactly are complex life cycles. Um, let me switch to the point. Uh, um, yeah, so we have two examples of animals with complex life cycles here. Um, on the left, we see um, a jellyfish with the sedentary um, polyp state and the free swimming uh, medusa state. And on the right, we see a frog with its aquatic tadpole. So animals with complex life cycles always show at least two distinct um, life phases, um, which are separated from each other by metamorphosis. And as strange and nightmarish this metamorphosis uh, may seem to us humans, it's actually found in eight out of 10 animals. So in 80% of all animals. And um, metamorphosis usually comes with um, strong morphological changes and changes in behavior and physiology. And even some of us humans reach a higher style, state of life by going through metamorphosis. And why do animals show this, um, these complex life cycles? Um, one of the main explanations for this is the adaptive decoupling hypothesis. Uh, hypothesis. And that states that metamorphosis may break up trade correlations between life phases. So what does this mean? If we look at this stonefly, um, they start their life as aquatic nymphs, uh, dealing with all the selection pressures that come with living in the water. They feed and grow and survive, hopefully, until they crawl out of the water and um, do their final mold, um, which is the metamorphosis to the adult. And the adult is um, airborne and usually and uh, yeah, terrestrial, and they mainly try to find mates, reproduce, disperse, and then die. So both life phases have um, very different functions. It's mainly growth and survival in the larva and reproduction and dispersal in the adult. So both life phases actually encounter very different um, selection pressures during their, their part of life. Um, now, my question was, uh, what does this increase in life cycle complexity mean for stoneflies with their aquatic nymphs and their terrestrial larva compared to what we, for example, find in earwigs, where both nymphs and adults are terrestrial and they share their same ecological nymphs, uh, niches. So nymphs and adults feed on the same stuff. They live in the same crevices. They basically do the same. They also look very similar already. So there's not... Um, not a big ecological shift here, whereas stoneflies have to deal with the um, antagonistic selection pressures of the aquatic lifestyle and the terrestrial lifestyle. So there's a strong ecological shift. So I was interested if, uh, in if this one single mold between the um, nymphs and the adult is actually enough to, um, to break up the trade correlations between these two life cycles. So if there's actually adaptive decoupling in stoneflies. Um, for this, I loaned um, 223 species of earwigs and stoneflies and by the, uh, from museums and private collections across Europe. And by this, I was able to cover all earwig and stonefly families, about three quarters of their subfamilies and one third of all stonefly and earwig genera. Um, in earwigs, Taxon coverage is a bit better, so I have about half of the genera in earwigs and about a fifth in stoneflies. Now, then we carried all these specimens to particle accelerators all across Europe, where we used the synchrotron radiation that comes out of these giant um, storage rings and sent them through our specimens. And by this, we could achieve um, high throughput and uh, high resolution. Um, microcomputer tomography. So we got um, image stacks of the inner and outer morphology um, and took them home and created um, uh, yeah, three-dimensional renderings from them. Here, for example, we see an earwig head, the eyes here, mandibles there. 
And then I placed anatomical reference points, also called landmarks, on all of these heads at the same positions, for example, at the mandible joints or where some sutures, head sutures meet and so on. So I placed these on all um, heads in order to quantify um, head shape variation in earwigs and stoneflies. I did not just place them on the outside of the head, but also on the inside. For example, on the um, inner uh, uh, endoskeletal structures or the opening of the head capsule towards the thorax. Yeah. Additionally, I went through, um, now it's 1,950 publications to find info on what the adults and nymphs of stoneflies and earwigs feed on and where they prefer to live. So if they rather live on the surface of plants or stones or under stones or under bark um, or in detritus or wherever. And also how fast the water um, flows in the aquatic um, um, yeah, habitats of the nymphs. So I call this um, the exposure of the nymphs to hydrodynamic pressure. Uh, this is how I coded. So I went through the literature and um, took out what they said, how much they feed on what or where they live, and uh, combined all the infos from all the literature into a giant table like this. Now let's switch to the results. Um, the first thing I did was a principal component analysis of head shape variation. Um, he see um, on the x-axis the first principal component, which um, well, represents about 21% of um, head shape variation in stoneflies and earwigs. And on the y-axis, it's the second principal component, which accounts for about 19% of head shape variation. We can see that this PC2 roughly separates stoneflies in blue from earwigs in orange. And um, well, in the background, you can always see the phylogeny of the taxa plotted there as well. So this is the phylomorphospace of head shape variation, adult head shape variation. Um, I also found significant allometric and phylogenetic signal in there. So I always accounted for allometry and for the non-independence of, um, well, phylogenetic non-independence of the species. Now, if we change the color code from order level to superfamily level, we already see some more details of what's going on in the morphospace here. For example, at the lower ends of PC1 and 2, you see these, um, uh, this cluster, and it belongs to two superfamilies, which are not closely related to each other. Um, and um, shows convergent evolution. For example, these green guys here, they live phoretically in the fur of bats in Malaysia and travel with the bats from cave to cave to feed on insects that themselves feed on the guano of the bats. So they live in the fur to travel with the bats. And these guys live on giant rats in Africa and actually feed on the skin and some fungus in there. So there's um, convergent evolution to um, an episoic lifestyle happening down here. Also from the literature work, I knew that these stoneflies up here, they all have uh, predatory nymphs. But um, yeah, to quantify um, and really analyze the correlation between ecology and adult head shape variation, I performed principal coordinate analysis of the literature data that I got um, for all the different um, ecological variables that I looked at, for example, larval food, adult food, larval microhabitat, and so on. And then I used the results of these principal coordinate analyses and combined them with my phylomorphospace. Um, so here um, we see in the background the results of the, or the values of the first axis of the principal component analysis for larval food. And blue means um, rather detritivoric larvae, and red means rather predatory nymphs. So if we go back, you see that the first axis here mainly separates detritivoric from predatory nymphs. Um, yeah, we can already see that there is um, that adult head shape variation follows um, nymphal feeding. So, you know, up here are the predatory nymphs or the species with predatory nymphs cluster, while here are the um, detritivoric plecopterans cluster. However, 
the uh, PCOA results is not just the first principal axis, which I color coded here, but there's many more axes um, which code for the other <clears throat> um, yeah, factor levels. Um, so what I now did was a multivariate analysis um, to find the correlation between um, ecology and head shape variation. And all this is phylogenetically corrected. So here are the results. Um, Non-significant um, correlations are well left blank here. So the only significant correlations of um, ecology and adult head shape variation that I found was for food. Um, so head shape variation of the adults follows nymphal and adult food preference, and it mm, a bit more strongly follows food preference. So these values are the effect sizes of the correlation. Now, if you remember, my main question was, um, does the increased life cycle complexity that we find in stoneflies actually result in a higher de adaptive decoupling? And if that were the case, I would expect that um, if I do these analysis for each order separately, that I would find high correlations in adults um, with, ad I mean, high correlation of adult head shape variation with food of adults and the low correlation with the food of the nymphs because adaptive decoupling would ontogenetically basically reset um, morphology so that it could follow the selection pressures of the adults. However, uh, the opposite is the case. So in the head, adult head shape variation of stoneflies, the only significant correlation with the high explanatory value that I found was with the food of the nymphs. So that means that um, adult head shape seems to be highly constrained by the nymphal phase. So it cannot uh, evolve independently from what is happening in the nymphal phase. So the single mold, which is the metamorphosis in stoneflies, um, does not seem to be able to disrupt the morphological trait correlations of nymphs and adults. Um, and since the section pressures are so different in, um, in the larval phase and the adult phase, it seems that adult phase cannot really evolve freely, but is highly constrained by what's happening in the larval phase. And I think Plecoptera met this lack of adapti uh, adaptive decoupling by basically shifting um, the import or the relative importance of the selection pressures that act on the head capsule from the adult phase to the nymphal phase. So what I mean by this is that um, the nymphs, they feed on really hard food like other insects or um, leaf litter and stuff like that. While then adults don't, well, feeding in adults does not play a really big role. They feed on rather soft stuff like pollen and um, they scratch algae from bark and so on. So the selection pressure regarding feeding that acts on the head capsule seem to be rather unimportant. And also the lifespan of the adults is really short compared to um, um, the nymphs. So um, in Demaptra, on the other hand, on the earwigs, it looks rather different. So since they feed on the same stuff and live in the same places and so on, um, the correlation of adult head shape variation with these ecological factors. <clears throat> Peter, you have, one minute. you have one minute left. All right, thanks. Um, are the same. Um, yeah, that leaves me the conclusions. Um, first of all, we know from the literature that metamorphosis can break up, <clears throat> sorry, trade covariances between life phases. And that um, this, uh, this allows alternating life phases to evolve independently from each other. Um, however, in hemimetabolous insects, metamorphosis is limited to only one mold that separates the nymph from the adult life phase. And non surprisingly, now we find that the low morphological change that happens with this last mold in stoneflies seems to not be sufficient to facilitate uh, adaptive decoupling. Um, but rather that the increased life cycle complexity even results in a higher coupling of traits across the metamorphic boundary in uh, stoneflies than we find in the fully terrestrial earwigs. Yeah, with this, I would like to thank you for listening. I also have to thank all the collaborators that uh, gave us their specimens for loan um, that allowed us scanning there and so on. 
um, also our funding agencies, which made my PhD position um, possible and also covered travel expenses. I would like to ask, uh, thank Peter, Pablo, Olivier and Georg for lending their private specimens to me and would like to thank um, my whole work group for the constant um, help and discussions. Yeah, that's it. Thank you.